The second and final presidential debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden took place on October 22nd, 2020, and was held at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. The event was moderated by Kristen Welker. In this video, I'm going to break down a lot of critical moments from this debate and, of course, give you my answer to the question, who won? The second debate was notably less disruptive and chaotic than the first debate thanks to new rules implemented by the Commission on Presidential Debates. At the beginning of each section, each candidate will have two minutes uninterrupted to answer my first question. The debate commission will then turn on their microphone only when it is their turn to answer, and the commission will turn it off exactly when the two minutes have expired. While President Trump opposed these changes, I think he showed marked improvement. Ironically, in part due to the fact that the mute button had a calming effect, which allowed Trump to show a slightly softer side. Probably the best change for Trump was his return to the populist rhetoric that got him elected four years ago. I have. You, you have raised a lot of money, tremendous amounts of money. And every time you raise money, deals are made. Yeah. I could raise so much more money as president and as somebody that knows most of those people. I could call the heads of Wall Street, the heads of every company in America. I would blow away every record, but I don't want to do that because it puts me in a bad position. And then you bring up Wall Street. You shouldn't be bringing up Wall Street because you're the one that takes the money from Wall Street, not me. Having a good relationship Trump, with leaders of on, other countries is a, a good country. thing. We have a lot of questions. Please we respond energy, and then I have to follow We are follow energy up. independent for the first time. We don't need all of these countries that we had to fight war over because we needed their energy. There's That's a typical seconds. political statement. Let's get off this China thing. And then he looks, the family, around the table, everything. Just right. a typical politician when I see that. Let's talk I'm about North Korea. I'm not a typical Korea politician. Okay, That's President why I got Trump. elected. That let's was, talk let's about get off the subject of China. Let's talk around sitting around the table. All right. Come on, Joe, you can we're, do better. We're gonna but that wasn't the only 2016 throwback. He also said some things about immigrants that were clearly reminiscent of the most polarized and comments he made at the beginning of his first presidential run. It was also a way of getting a lot of money from our people's pockets to people that come into our country illegally. We were going to take care of everything for them. Catch and release is a disaster. A murderer would come in, a rapist would come in, a very bad person would come in. He also pulled out a classic joke, this tried and true one-liner. I am the least racist person in this room. An oldie but a goodie. Now Trump actually opened the debate lying in his very first sentence. So as you know, 2.2 million people modeled out were expected to die. We closed up the greatest economy in the world in order to fight this horrible disease that came from China. So I think everyone knows by now that the 2.2 million figure refers to a model predicting what would happen if no action was taken. What most people probably don't know is that the widely publicized figure came from Professor Neil Ferguson of Imperial College, who has for two decades made inflated estimates of potential disease death tolls. John Fund of the Conservative National Review broke it down this way. In 2002, Ferguson predicted that by 2080, up to 150,000 people could die from exposure to BSE, mad cow disease, in beef. In the UK, there were only 177 deaths from BSE. In 2005, Ferguson predicted that up to 150 million people could be killed from bird flu. In the end, only 282 people died worldwide from the disease between 2003 and 2009. In 2009, a government estimate based on Ferguson's advice said a reasonable worst case scenario was that swine flu would lead to 65,000 British deaths. In the end, swine flu killed 457 people in the UK. Now, Biden's opening line, in my view, was far more effective. 220,000 Americans dead. If you hear nothing else I say tonight, hear this. Anyone who's responsible for not taking control, in fact, not saying I'm, I take no responsibility initially, anyone who's responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president of the United States of America. Simple, straight to the point, and pretty persuasive. Trump made a strange gambit in this debate, continuing to insist that the country was rounding a corner, even suggesting that a vaccine would arrive very soon. We're rounding the turn, we're rounding the corner, it's going away. You also said a vaccine will be coming 
within weeks? Yes. Is that a guarantee? Is, no, it's is not this... a guarantee, but it will be by the end of the year. But I think it has a good chance. There are two companies, I think, within a matter of weeks. Now, if a vaccine actually does come out before Election Day, one that nonpartisan health officials say is safe and effective, then Trump will benefit from saying this. It would speak to his credibility and his confident leadership. But if a vaccine does not emerge before Election Day, voters are probably likely to see this as a broken promise, even though technically he did not promise it, and he said by the end of the year, not Election Day. In the meantime, making the promise that we're rounding the corner looks bad as cases continue to rise. It also allowed Biden the opportunity to make the point that Trump's previous COVID predictions have been about as reliable as those produced by Neil Ferguson of Imperial College. He's, this is the same fellow who told you this is going to end by Easter last time. This is the same fellow who told you that, don't worry, we're going to end this by the summer. We're about to go into a dark winter, a dark winter. And he has no clear plan and there's no prospect that there's going to be a vaccine available for the majority of the American people before the middle of next year. But Trump set up Biden even stronger when he said that people were learning to live with the pandemic. He says that we're, uh, you know, we're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. That man or wife going to bed tonight and reaching over to try to touch their out of habit where their wife or husband was is gone. Learning to live with it. Come on. We're dying with it. This was certainly one of the most memorable lines from the debate. The other extremely memorable moment coming from the COVID discussion came mostly from the president. And you say, I take no responsibility. Let me talk about your two. Excuse me. I take, Very full, I take full responsibility. It's not my fault that it came here. It's China's fault. And you know what? It's not Joe's fault that it came here either. Yeah, so he literally said, I take full responsibility, immediately followed by the phrase, it's not my fault. That's not a good look. Another unfortunate moment for Trump coming out of the COVID discussion was about opening up schools and transmissions to teachers. Okay. families. I want to open the schools. Uh, the transmittal rate to the teachers is uh, very small but I want to open the schools. We have to open our country. We're not going to have a country. All you teachers out there, not that many of you are going to die, so don't worry about it. So don't worry about it. Come on. Yeah, so that's another dunk on Trump from Biden. One of Biden's strongest moments was channeling a bit of Bernie Sanders railing against billionaires as Trump talked about the stock market. They said the stock market will boom if I'm elected. If he's elected, the stock market will crash. Okay, let's move right. on to the next question the very market. quickly. Look, the idea that the stock market is booming is his only measure of what's happening. Where I come from in Scranton and Claymont, the people don't live off of the stock market. Just in the, uh, just in the last three, uh, three years during this crisis, the, the billionaires in this country made, according to the Wall Street, 700 billion more dollars. 700 billion more dollars because that's his only measure. What happens to the ordinary people out there? What happens to them? Let's talk about what's happening on Capitol Hill. We're, we're going to move on, 401ks gentlemen. are through the roof. We're going to move on. People's stock are through the roof. All right. And he doesn't come from Scranton. This exchange looks terrible for Trump. He refers to the stock market. Biden talks about ordinary people. And then Trump returns to talking about people's stocks and 401ks. Another strong moment for Biden was reminding voters about Trump's family separation policy. Yeah. These 500 plus kids came with parents. They separated them at the border to make it a disincentive to come to begin with. They real tough. We're really strong. And guess what? They cannot. It's not coyotes didn't bring them over. Their parents were with them. They got separated from their parents. Trump's defense seemed to center on the question of which administration actually built the physical cages, which I think is pretty obviously besides the point. Trump's 2018 zero tolerance policy led to thousands of family separations, something that was a relatively uncommon practice during the Obama administration. Who built the cages, let's, Joe? Let's talk about what Who we're built talking the cages, about. Joe? Let's talk about what we're talking about. What happened? Parents were ripped, their kids were ripped from their arms and separated. And now they cannot find over 500 sets of those parents, and those kids are alone. Also connected to immigration, Trump claimed in the debate that just 1% of asylum seekers under catch and release showed up for their court hearings. Those with the lowest IQs. And then you say they come back. Less than 1% of the people come back. We have to send ICE out 
and Border Patrol out to find them, we would say, come back in two years, three years, we're going to give you a court case. You need Perry Mason. We're going to give you a court case. When you say they come back, they don't come back, Joe. Yeah. They never come back. Only the really, I hate to say this, but those with the lowest IQ. The president is just flat wrong here. According to Justice Department figures between 2012 and 2016, migrants failed to show up to court hearings between 11 and 28% of the time. Now, a typically ineffective line of attack against Trump for Democrats is anything involving Russia, since Trump has done a pretty good job of essentially mischaracterizing the Mueller report as clearing him on all Russia-related scandal. Still, Biden made a strong argument in this area, pointing to Trump's lack of pushback to Putin putting bounties on the heads of American soldiers. I don't understand why this president is unwilling to take on Putin when he's actually paying bounties to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan, when he's engaged in activities that are trying to destabilize all of NATO. I don't know why he doesn't do it, but it's worth asking the question, why isn't that being done? Any country that interferes with us will, in fact, pay a price because they're affecting our sovereignty. Trump did not respond directly to that point and instead decided to focus a lot of attention on Hunter Biden's allegedly shady dealings with Russian elites. Joe got three and a half million dollars from Russia and it came through Putin because he was very friendly with the former mayor of Moscow and it was the mayor of Moscow's wife and you got three and a half million dollars. Your family got three and a half million dollars and you know, someday you're going to have to explain why did you get three and a half? I never got any money from Russia. I don't get money from Russia. So the $3.5 million that Trump is referencing comes from a report produced by the U.S. Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs and the Senate Committee on Finance, chaired by Republican Senators Ron Johnson and Chuck Grassley, respectively. While Republicans have made a lot out of the report, Democrats have described it as a politically motivated hit job. The report claims that $3.5 million was wired from Elena Baturina, the wife of a former Moscow mayor, to a company called Rosemount Seneca Thornton. The report, as well as a report from Financial Times, claim that the company was co-founded by Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden's lawyer has claimed that he was not a co-founder of the company and had no financial interest in it. The company was incorporated in Delaware and the records do not name the founder. So Hunter Biden may or may not have co-founded the company. Assuming he did, we still don't know whether he still had some role in the company when the transfer was made. Assuming that he was, we still don't know if the transfer made its way into Hunter's pockets. And even assuming all that, we still don't know if there's anything nefarious about the payment. Not to mention, none of this ties back to Joe Biden, and there is evidence to suggest otherwise. As a Vox article points out, Trump's team has hoped to prove that Joe Biden himself got a share of Hunter's money. Yet Joe Biden's tax returns and financial disclosure forms show no sign of any such thing. And after the Obama administration, Joe and Jill Biden made more than $15 million in 2017 and 2018, mainly from speaking fees and book payments, so they certainly weren't hurting for cash. So to believe Trump's narrative here, we have to make a number of dubious assumptions, and I don't think a rational person should do that. All we seem to know for certain is that a rich lady in Moscow sent a lot of money to a company in Delaware. While there are other cases where Hunter Biden has seemed to benefit from his father's status, and for example his role in a Ukrainian mining company, this wire transfer narrative lacks a lot of veracity. It probably feels true if you're predisposed to mistrusting the Bidens, and I can't blame you for that, but there's scant evidence to support the narrative. As for Trump having no Russian financial ties, well, that's an equally dubious proposition. Trump himself has touted the Mueller report as clearing him of all collusion, but that same report highlights three separate proposals to develop a Trump property in Moscow around the time of the 2016 election. Beyond this, as reported by the Los Angeles Times, Trump has sought and received funding from Russian investors for his business ventures, especially after most American banks stopped lending to him following his multiple bankruptcies. Trump's architect, Alan Lapidus, has also claimed that Trump got investment from Russia. Trump could not get money here. He found Russia, and the Russians gave him a lot of money. He's got to be doing a quid pro quo. It's just logical. It's just too much money. While he has since denied having ever said this, Eric Trump was quoted back in 2014 
claiming this about the Trump Organization's financial backers. Well, we don't rely on American banks. We have all the funding we need out of Russia. Look, because of the history of and the reaction to the Mueller report, pretty much any information involving connections between Trump and Russia ends up being muddied by severely partisan frameworks. Republicans tend to think any connection at all are all fake news. Democrats are inclined to think Trump is Putin's puppet. But putting all of that to one side, looking at the available reporting, I find it hard to believe that Trump and his company have never had any financial dealings with Russia. Vice President Biden, you may respond. And then I do I, want to follow up on the election security. I have not taken a penny from any foreign source ever in my life. We learned that this president paid 50 times the tax in China, has a secret bank account with China, does business in China, and in fact, is talking about me taking money. I have not taken a single penny from any country whatsoever, ever, number one. This is true. Trump had a Chinese bank account, which he claims he opened in 2013 and closed in 2015, just before running for president. I have released all of my tax returns, 22 years, go look at them, 22 years of my tax return. You have not released a single solitary year of your tax return. What are you hiding? Why are you unwilling? The foreign countries are paying you a lot. Russia's paying you a lot. China's paying you a lot. And your hotels and all your businesses all around the country, all around the world. And China's building a new road to a new ga a, a, a golf course you have overseas. So what's going on here? Why don't release your tax return or stop talking about corruption? President. Okay, so it's no surprise that Trump hasn't released his taxes. Since the 2016 election, he's been saying that he's not releasing them because he's under audit and he'll release them soon. Of course, that doesn't legally prevent him from releasing his taxes, but Trump has claimed that his lawyers have advised him against it. None of this is new. But Biden pointing his finger at Trump and asking, what are you hiding, is pretty strong. Reinforcing that he's released 22 years of his own taxes also demonstrates that he's been more transparent on the subject. If you're an undecided voter and you're trying to decide which candidate is more trustworthy, this moment clearly breaks in Biden's direction. What did I pay? They said, sir, you prepaid tens of millions of dollars. I prepaid my tax. Tens over the last number of years, tens of millions of dollars I prepaid because at some point they think it's an estimate. They think I may have to pay tax. So I already prepaid it. Nobody told me that. Did your account Nobody tell, tell you, you, you that. You Excuse them? me. And it wasn't written whenever they write this. They keep talking about $750, which I think is a filing fee. Okay, so obviously the IRS does not charge a $750 filing fee. He just made that up. As for prepaying tens of millions of dollars in taxes, that is possible. Although I do find it very strange that Trump only just came up with this excuse now, nearly a month after the New York Times report on his taxes. I can't expect that anyone other than his existing supporters is liable to believe this. When I met with Barack Obama, we sat in the White House, right at the beginning, had a great conversation. It was supposed to be 15 minutes and it was well over an hour. He said the biggest problem we have with North is North Korea. He indicated we will be in a war with North Korea. Guess what? It would be a nuclear war. And he does have plenty of nuclear capability. In the meantime, I have a very good relationship with him. Different kind of a guy, but he probably thinks the same thing about me. We have a different kind of a relationship. We have a very good relationship, and there's no war. Instead of being in a war where millions of people, Seoul, you know, is 25 miles away. Millions and millions, 32 million people in Seoul. Millions of people would be okay. dead right now. President we Trump, don't have that's a war, 30 and seconds. I have a good Thank relationship. you. Uh, right. One of the things that I personally support about President Trump has been his willingness to meet with North Korea and attempt to broker more peaceful relations. But Trump loses me when he claims that Obama told him that there was going to be a nuclear war with North Korea. I feel like he's probably oversimplifying what Obama actually told him. What he probably told him was that North Korea should be a top national security priority and that Kim Jong-un may test him in the early months of his presidency. This would be more aligned to the reporting on the topic from the time. Here's what the Wall Street Journal wrote about this in November of 2016. The Obama administration considers North Korea to be the top national security priority for the incoming administration, a view it has conveyed to President-elect Donald Trump's transition team, according to people familiar with the conversations. President-elect Trump could have to confront the North Korean problem early in his term. Pyongyang often takes provocative action during U.S. political transitions to get attention and see how the Americans will respond. 
North Korea tested its second device in the early months of President Obama's first term. You've said you wouldn't meet with Kim Jong-un without preconditions. Are there any conditions under which you would meet with him? On the condition that he would agree that he would be drawing down his nuclear capacity to get that the Korean Peninsula should be nuclear free zone. In the words of Donald Trump, you just lost the left. Not really, but yeah, insisting that Kim Jong-un gets rid of his nuclear arsenal as a precondition to meeting with him is absurd. I don't think anyone with two brain cells to rub together thinks it would be easy to get the North Koreans to abandon their missile program, even with a meeting. So the idea that they'll do so just for the honor of meeting with President Biden is absurd. So his policy means there will be no meeting. Having a good relationship Trump, with leaders of on. other countries yes, is a, a lot good of thing. We have a lot of questions to get yes. to. Not Your like saying we had a good relationship with Hitler before he in fact invaded Europe, the rest of Europe. Come on. The implication of Biden's analogy is that North Korea is likely to attempt to invade its neighbors, which I really don't believe is so. Their oversized military and nuclear arsenal is almost certainly seen by their own leadership as defensive, a necessary measure to prevent American invasion. America's intelligence community agrees that Kim Jong-un is not likely to try to seek World War III. In its 2019 Worldwide Threat Assessment, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence wrote, that North Korea has actually dismantled some of its WMD infrastructure, but that North Korean leaders view nuclear arms as critical to regime survival. The same report from 2017 explained, We have long assessed that Pyongyang's nuclear capabilities are intended for deterrence, international prestige, and coercive diplomacy. So while Kim Jong-un may well be a monstrous authoritarian tyrant and the government he oversees may be incredibly destructive for North Koreans, implying that North Koreans' foreign policy intentions are the same as Germany's in the 1930s is dangerously incorrect. Beyond that, Biden's analogy also implies that talking with or negotiating with Kim Jong-un is the same thing as the pre-World War II policy of appeasement. That is also a misguided view. Appeasement was the policy closely associated with Neville Chamberlain of allowing Germany to expand its territory unchecked. North Korea has not been doing that. So to Biden, I must say, come on, man. Come on. Moving on to healthcare, Donald Trump talked about how he got rid of the individual mandate, which indeed was the most controversial part of the Affordable Care Act. However, I think he also pretty clearly demonstrated that he doesn't understand what Biden's plan is. We have 180 million people out there that have great private health care, far more than we're talking about with Obamacare. Joe Biden is going to terminate all of those policies. These are people that love their health care. Nobody ever thought health care could be so complicated. Biden's plan, of course, is not Medicare for all. It's protecting the Affordable Care Act and adding a public option. This in no way eliminates private health care. In fact, during the Democratic primaries, Biden railed against more progressive plans presented by Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren on exactly this point. Biden indeed pointed this out. The idea that I want to eliminate private insurance, the reason why I had such a fight for, with 20 candidates for the nomination was I support private insurance. That's why I did not one single person with private insurance would lose their insurance under my plan, nor did they under Obamacare. They did not lose their insurance unless they chose they wanted to go to something else. The only thing he got wrong here is that actually technically some plans were eliminated by Obamacare. These so-called skinny plans which did not meet minimum standards of coverage. Trump has, during his presidency, worked at reversing this, expanding the availability of skinny plans. He wants socialized medicine, and it's not that he wants it. His vice president, I mean, she is, is more liberal than Bernie Sanders and wants it even more. So again, Biden doesn't want socialized medicine. In my opinion, that is not to his credit. Countries that do have socialized medicine tend to have better health care outcomes and pay less for it. As far as Kamala Harris goes, she did co-sponsor Bernie's Medicare for All plan in the Senate, but when it came to running for president, she came out against it. This is all very strange to me because Trump is essentially fear-mongering about Biden on the false premise that he's going to introduce a healthcare system that works very well in countries like Canada. Trump made a very similar mistake with regards to climate change. Rather than take on the relatively moderate climate proposals that Joe Biden actually supports, Trump decided to make the false assertion that Biden's plans were developed by the left. 
If you look at what he wants to do, you know, the if you look at his plan, Not, his environmental plan, you know who developed it? AOC plus three. They know nothing about the climate. I mean, she's got a good line of stuff, but she knows nothing about the climate. And they're all hopping through hoops for AOC plus three. Look. Trump also made this claim in the first presidential debate, so I won't spend much time on it. But basically, the only thing AOC and Joe Biden have in common when it comes to climate policy is that they both have used the term Green New Deal. By any measure, Biden's environmental policy is far more limited in scope and less ambitious when it comes to specific targets. While as a progressive, I have never been particularly impressed by Biden's milquetoast environmental policies, I think this was an area where Trump really sounded like he had no idea what he was talking about. They want to knock down buildings and build new buildings with little, tiny, small windows. I love solar, but solar doesn't quite have it yet. It's not powerful yet to, to really run our big, beautiful factories that we need. I know more about wind than you do. Oh. It's extremely expensive, kills all the birds. <laughs> it's very intermittent, it's got a lot of problems, and they happen to make the windmills in both Germany and China. And the fumes coming up, if you're a believer in carbon emission, the fumes coming up to make, make these massive windmills is more than anything that we're talking about with natural gas, which is very clean. One other thing, when he says buildings, they want to take buildings down because I want to make bigger windows into smaller windows. As far as they're concerned, if you had no window, it would be a lovely thing. One area where Trump demonstrated a lot more knowledge was in what Biden had said about fracking. Trump accused the former VP of promising to end fracking, a claim which Biden flatly denied. Respond. Never said I oppose fracking. You said it I, on tape. I did show the tape. Put it on your website. I'll put it on. Put it on the website. The fact of the matter is show he's flat line okay let's roll the tape no more no new fracking we, we are we are going to get rid of fossil fuels well, like what about say stopping fracking and stopping yeah. new pipes? would there be any place for fossil fuels including coal and fracking in a biden administration no it would be, we would we would work it out we would make sure it's eliminated i guarantee you i guarantee you we're going to end fossil fuel and i am not going to clock it no ability for the oil industry to continue to drill, period. Ends. Number one. Three consecutive American presidents have enjoyed stints of explosive economic growth due to a boom in oil and natural gas production. As president, would you be willing to sacrifice some of that growth, even knowing potentially that it could displace thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of blue-collar workers in the interest of transitioning to that greener economy? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. No more, no new fracking. All right, that video was put together by Americans for Tax Reform, a conservative advocacy group founded by Grover Norquist. While some of the clips here take his comments out of context, and Biden has never actually had specific policy proposals to ban all fracking, he did frequently talk vaguely about ending fracking on the campaign trail and during the Democratic debates. The truth is, Biden wants it both ways. He wants liberal voters to believe him when he vaguely gestures against fracking, but he wants conservatives and corporations to know that he's not going to do anything about it. Except perhaps for the small measure of not allowing new oil and gas permits on public lands and waters. That's actually part of his platform. Moving on to race. One of the stronger moments for Biden was when he was called upon to express an understanding of what people of color go through in America. What I didn't, I never had to tell my daughter, if she's pulled over, make sure she puts for a, a traffic stop, put both hands on top of the wheel and don't reach for the glove box because someone may shoot you. Trump had a somewhat less effective response to the same question. He's been in government 47 years. He never did a thing except in 1994 when he did such harm to the black community. And they were called, and he called them, super predators. And he said that. He said it, super predators. Well, Trump is right to call attention to the crime bill. The super predators claim is false. I already fact-checked this in depth when he made the exact same claim at the first presidential debate. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. And if you look... With the exception of Abraham Lincoln, possible exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln, nobody has done what I've done. Trump has made this claim before in the past. Obviously, this is a matter of opinion, but I don't think anyone other than the most ardent Trump supporter would give it any kind of credence. Even though Trump is frustratingly egomaniacal on this point, 
It should be noted that he did sign into law significant changes to the federal criminal justice system with the First Step Act. Some of the changes this act made include prioritizing rehabilitation in federal prisons, relief for 3,000 people serving harsh sentences for crack charges, requirements for prisoners to be housed in facilities near their families, provision of free feminine hygiene products for female prisoners, and new oversight and transparency requirements for the Bureau of Prisons. Trump should be given a lot of credit for supporting this. The bill had bipartisan support, meaning Democrats get to share the credit, but I do think it was more politically risky for Republicans to support changes that have traditionally been fought for by the left. At the same time, Biden is correct to point out that Trump's overall history has not always been so positive for the black community. After the crime bill had been in, 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 in the law for a while, this is a guy who said, the problem with the crime bill, there's not enough people in jail. There's not enough people in jail. And go on my website, get the quote, the date when he said it, not enough people. He talked about marauding gangs, young gangs, and the people who are going to maraud our cities. This is a guy who in the Central Park Five, five innocent black kids, he continued to push for making sure that they got the death penalty. None of them were, none of them were guilty of what the crime of the crimes they were suggested. I also think it was commendable that Biden acknowledged that his tough on crime past was a mistake. Said in the 80s we passed 100%, all 100 senators voted for it, a bill on drugs and how to deal with drugs. It was a mistake. I've been trying to change the sense and particularly the portion on cocaine. That's why I've been arguing that in fact we should not send anyone to jail for a pure drug offense. They should be going into treatment across the board. Now in terms of overall, who won the debate, let's break this down into three separate categories. When it comes to making better arguments and being more truthful, I think Biden easily takes the prize. Both candidates made poor arguments and false statements throughout the debate, but I do think Trump lied more and made more poorer arguments. He seemed especially out of his depth when talking about climate change and healthcare. In both cases, Trump misidentified Biden's policy stances and didn't even really offer arguments for why these more left-wing proposals, the ones that he was arguing against, were bad. Nor did he offer his own solutions for how to deal with these issues. When it comes to most improved, however, I think Trump is the victor. In the first presidential debate, Trump came off as a bully. He was extremely disruptive and very unlikable. In this debate, he struck a far more likable, softer tone. He also recaptured some of the populist magic that had made him so successful in 2016. His performance was probably seen by many as especially good because he had set the bar fairly low last time around. In fairness, Biden's performance also improved. He brought better lines of attack to this debate and demonstrated better energy. But the changes to Trump's performance were more obvious, in my opinion. Now the third and final category is really the one that matters, and is generally how I have talked about debates in the past. Who won when it comes to persuading voters. That is, who presented themselves in such a way that they are likely to win over more votes. It's a question about perception, not substance. Lying doesn't generally matter, nor does making poor arguments as long as the fallacies can be expected to be missed by the general public. What does matter here is having catchier lines and being perceived as the winner in the most memorable moments. It also helps to appear to have the upper hand early on in the debate. By all three of these measures, I think Joe Biden takes the cake. The COVID conversation happened at the beginning of the evening and this subject matter is likely to be considered the most important for voters. It was during this conversation that Biden was probably most effective. He appeared to dunk on Trump a number of times with lines like, they're learning to die with it. Meanwhile, Trump dropped the ball by, for example, saying he takes full responsibility before immediately blaming China. When it comes to actually improving their odds with voters, the Ipsos 538 study supports my stance that Biden won, but narrowly so. The average likelihood for respondents to vote for Biden moved from 5.0 before the debate and 5.2 after it. With Trump, the same average declined slightly from 3.8 to 3.7. Perhaps more significant is the assessment of this debate within the context of the race overall. The truth of the matter is that Trump probably needed an overwhelming victory in this debate 
in order to secure a strong chance of winning the election in November. 538's election forecast gives Biden an 87 in 100 chance to win the Electoral College. RCP's no toss-up projection gives Biden an almost landslide victory of 357 to 181. The Cook Political Reports map has Biden winning 290 Electoral College points with solid likely and leans, meaning he would win even if Trump takes all of the toss-up states. Underdogs, of course, have won elections before. In fact, of course, Trump won as an underdog in 2016. But the fact that Biden is strongly favored means that Trump's campaign desperately needed the president to pull out a solid win in this debate. That didn't happen. Even if we are to be generous to Trump and claim that the debate was basically a toss-up or a tie, within the greater context of the race, that's not enough for the Trump campaign. With the odds against him and a loss in the first debate, Trump needed to do better than leave it an open question as to who won.